Birthday Society in London. Or Berlin, Paris, New York, Toronto, Tokyo. The spread of the big coffee chains has become one of globalization's most powerful icons, luring customers with an exotic range of cappuccinos, espressos, mochas, and blends of coffee from far-flung climes. Coffee is one of the most traded commodities in the world, a major cash crop for many poor developing countries trying to trade their way out of poverty. Coffee promises to increase developing countries' share of income from agriculture on world markets, in line with Millennium Development Goal Number 8's commitment to a global partnership for development. But the international coffee industry is in crisis, and many coffee-producing countries are facing disaster. This LIFE programme explores the reasons why and some of the possible solutions. According to the International Coffee Organization, there are almost 7 billion kilograms of coffee produced every year in countries like Brazil, Jamaica, Kenya, Uganda, Guatemala, Honduras, Nepal, Mexico, Vietnam and Ethiopia. Coffee is considered to be the second largest traded commodity in the world after oil. Indeed, uh, we estimate that uh, more than 8 $85 billion are involved in the annual trade uh, of coffee. But the price coffee drinkers pay for their cappuccinos and lattes bears little relation to the prices paid to the farmers who actually grow the beans. Over the last six years, coffee-producing countries have seen their earnings from the coffee market fall by a fifth, from seven and a half to around six billion dollars. Today's coffee farmers, there are an estimated 25 million of them, receive less than 1% of the price of a cup of coffee sold in a coffee bar. Why not you get it a more? <clears throat> we are very worried about the crisis. If this goes on, we will lose everything. In the past, all children went to school. But nowadays, half of them have to stay at home because we cannot pay anymore. There's no work anywhere because of the situation with coffee, which isn't worth anything, and the harvest has dropped off. This coffee problem has been a big problem for both me and my children. It's caused us a great deal of instability. The crisis has already halved the number of people working full-time in coffee farming in Central America. In the current buyer's market, the price coffee farmers in many countries are getting for their coffee doesn't cover their production costs. Coffee farmers who grow the coffee, who pick it and sell it on, gain just four cents out of every dollar of coffee that is sold on the supermarket shelves. Meanwhile, the supermarkets and the four giant roasters of coffee gain the great lion's share of the, of the dollar price that's sold on those, on those supermarket shelves. At the heart of the crisis in the coffee industry today is overproduction. From 1975 until 1989, coffee prices remained relatively stable. So did the supply and demand for coffee beans, monitored by the International Coffee Agreement, which helped guarantee coffee farmers their livelihood. But in 1989, the International Coffee Agreement broke down, ending the 27-year deal between coffee-producing countries which had regulated the supply and quality of coffee beans coming onto the world market. Since then, it's been a free-for-all, with new, lower-cost producers entering the market, leading to overproduction, a wider variety of poorer quality coffees competing for sales, a 50% reduction in the international price for coffee, and, on top of all this, an apparent downturn in the amount of coffee being drunk in the US and parts of Europe. There have been winners as well as losers. Vietnam, for example, sees the opportunities opened up by deregulation to become a major player in the global coffee market. In the late 1980s, Vietnam produced just 1.5 million bags of coffee a year, statistically a tiny amount. But helped by government subsidies, mainly to small farmers with low production costs, Vietnam increased its coffee production 10 times over. It now produces, in an overproduced market, up to 15 million bags per annum. In 10 years, it's become the second biggest coffee-producing country in the world. 
But has this rapid expansion affected the quality of the product? Uh, in Vietnam, you can find very good quality coffee, but unfortunately, because they grew so fast, they did in 10 years what a country like Colombia did in 100 years. So they are very good at developing their agriculture, but when the processing of coffee takes place, there are many mistakes, many difficulties. The quality is not as good as, a, as another origin that has a tradition and a technology in producing good quality coffee, the market will pay less for that low quality coffee. But Vietnam's not the only country responsible for the overproduction in the coffee market. Brazil, with 300,000 farmers and 3 million people directly employed in the coffee industry, remains the world's biggest coffee producer. Here, mechanized harvesting is increasingly used on large-scale coffee plantations. But modernization and questions about the quality of the beans have hurt farmers in the more traditional coffee-producing countries. Ethiopia is renowned as the cradle of coffee cultivation. Here in the Kaffa region, coffee is grown in the rainforest in the same way as it has been for centuries. No big plantations, and environmentally friendly production. But producing coffee this way in today's market is expensive. There is a lot of coffee in the world nowadays, so we have to make our coffee the best product. You must only pick the red berries. Only the red ones? Yes. Where is your basket? I will show you. Only the red ones that are ripe, not the dry one, nor the green or overripe ones. Only the red ones. They are good. Coffee is grown in Ethiopia under the shade of a big uh, indigenous trees in all places. If there are places in, the, in this country where uh, coffee is grown by itself under a big uh, trees in the forest, the coffee beans fall, from, fall to the ground and they grow by themselves again and uh, without any human interaction. It's grown without the application of any uh, chemicals, chemical fertilizer or chemical herbicide or uh, any insecticide is not used on the Ethiopian coffee. Today, coffee accounts for over 50% of Ethiopia's export revenues. 700,000 households are dependent on it. Despite worldwide overproduction and competition from cheaply produced beans, Ethiopian producers are concentrating on quality. They reason that their coffee's reputation and traditions will still sell in today's difficult markets. Finer picking for quality is taking place in the store. That is what they are going to do oh, maybe every afternoon when they take the coffee to the, to, to the warehouse. But what I'm telling them is to, to look into the coffee here thoroughly so that it might be easier uh, in the afternoon to check for quality. So they should take out the bad ones? Yes, the bad ones like this one. For example, this, uh, these coffees are very, uh, very, very small and also they might be, they are black. So all these kinds of coffees are not fit. So they have to be taken out of uh, these coffees. This is the quality control which we are making at the farmer's level. All these coffees are now the best ones. These are the best ones now because there is no improper uh, coffee in this one. Uh, all are of good quality. That's why I'm uh, proud of uh, the quality of uh, Ethiopian coffee. But the combination of Tedessa's hand-picking and labor-intensive production methods means a higher price, a price the buyers are not necessarily willing to pay.
buyers are very powerful. They are not paying a good price for the farmers. They are paying a price which is very lower than that of the cost of production. So we cannot say that buyers are buying in a good price from the farmers or from the suppliers. Because, uh, because of the oversupply of coffee in the world market, and the countries like Vietnam, which are producing very cheap and a lot of coffees, they are getting coffee from there. Because of this, um, it's a buyer's market today, not an um, exporter's market or not a producer's market. The rapid expansion of cafes in the developed world obscures another factor in the coffee crisis. While coffee consumption worldwide is going up, it's not keeping pace with the steep rise in worldwide production. And in some parts of the world, Germany, France, throughout the European Union and the USA, consumption is actually falling. Some experts worry that poorer quality coffees will mean even less coffee drinkers. What we are trying to say is to the producer first, try not to put into the market substandard coffee. Try not to produce substandard coffee. And you also say to the roses, don't buy it? And that we cannot say. Coffee also has other competitors, like soft drinks, which could pose a threat. In the long run, there could be a problem because the, there is a competition with other liquids out there. And it's their responsibility and their game to see what do we offer to the consumer. And I give you this very clear statement in the sense that those countries in the traditional markets in which there has been an increase of some low quality coffees, we see a decreasing consumption. Consumption per capita in countries like Germany. There are roasters and roasters. There are some that only use the best qualities. There are others that mix a little bit more. I cannot qualify what the business attitude of the roaster is, uh, but they know that if they do not maintain a minimal level of, of, of quality, sooner or later, the consumer is going to desert them. It's a matter of how the consumer is approached, how the blends are, are made, and the technology that intervenes in the processing of coffee in consuming countries is a more and more sophisticated. Now there are procedures to take bad quality coffee with a lot of defects, do evaporization, and, and take out uh, bad taste or bad uh, uh, smells. I think that there is a lack of transparency for the consumer about what he is drinking. Seventy percent of the world's coffee is produced on farms of less than 10 hectares. For these small farmers, the boom in cafes and coffee shops in the developed world in recent years has not brought huge benefits. Because the amount of coffee they're selling is actually quite small. If you see companies like Starbucks, like Costa, like many companies that develop around the world, they are expanding, they are offering and they are attracting a way of life. Coffee is just part of it. Uh, if you look closely the proportions, you will see that coffee is not the higher proportion in what is being sold. Uh, but it's new approach, is new consumers, but it's a very small segment of the market. Coffee producing countries have seen the value of the coffee they export fall by 20% in the last decade, from 10 billion US dollars in 1990 to 6 billion in 2000. But they could sell to their own populations. I give you the example of Brazil, that in eight years went from 8 million bags to 14 million bags of consumption. It's a big population, the incomes of the country have increased. We have that, we think that countries like Colombia, like Mexico, like India, like Indonesia, with the population and the incomes they have, they could repeat that example. Yet another option for small coffee producing farmers is to diversify and move into other crops but crops which have a value and a market. Growing coca for the cocaine trade has been an option for farmers in Central America. Other crops are more difficult. 
prices drop and people find that they go out of business and they can't make money in it, so they get out. That is the nature of the market. You have at the moment an oversupply in coffee. There is no doubt that people will leave coffee production. Uh, they will either uh, leave the land completely and go into cities and towns looking for jobs, or they will switch to other methods, other production. But as the Ethiopian farmers who face this dilemma understand only too well, it's hard to invest in new crops without any money. If the world does not take an interest in our coffee, we may just as well plough the land and grow something else. But we don't even have money for oxen. Coffee farmers would love to diversify out of coffee, but they find themselves imprisoned by walls set up by rich countries. If they want to move into uh, maize, they find their markets are dumped. If they want to move into um, if they want to move into peanuts, they find they can't export because there's huge uh, barriers to exporting uh, peanuts, for instance, to the United States. So although they sh they are desperate to move out and everything is screaming at them to move out of coffee, they actually find themselves imprisoned, unable to shift out of, of coffee. Fair trade offers another way out of the coffee crisis. Currently, fair trade accounts for just 1% of the global coffee market, although it is growing. Sales of fair trade brands increased by 22% between 2001 and 2002. Fair trade enables consumers to make a choice over how their coffee is produced. Fair trade plays a vital role in so many uh, coffee farmers' lives. It's increased massively because there's a strong consumer demand for a, a coffee that has been produced and bought at a decent price that's been paid back to that farmer. Equally, the money that's paid back to the cooperatives is invested in the, in, in the communities, such as in, in the schools, in the health clinics, but also in the marketing of that coffee for the future. It provides a vital source of revenue for many, many poor uh, coffee farmers. The fair trade principle of guaranteeing price is important to farmers who suffer when coffee prices fluctuate or drop. If the company could give us a single price, that of the fair market, that would be good. In the current market, it wouldn't be worthwhile harvesting the coffee because we won't be able to pay the workers. Fair trade is well-intentioned, but my own personal belief is that what the farmers overseas are looking for in the countries in which we deal which is, after all, five-sixths of the world, uh, what they're looking for is non-intervention. They're looking for a fair chance to compete. And there is a lot less rules if you have uh, the opportunity to compete and the markets do the job for you. And I think my impression is uh, that farmers, even in distant areas, even illiterate farmers, have given me lectures on pricing in the Chicago markets. Uh, they know this today. Uh, technology has revolutionized uh, the world of agriculture, and these are not stupid people. Uh, and I've yet to meet a stupid farmer. Fair trade coffee also acts as a quality guarantee. Producers sell direct to importers like Simon Wakefield. Simon has spent much of his working life around coffee beans, working with the farmers who produce them and making decisions about quality. For him, it's an all-consuming passion. We're looking for um, a good full-bodied flavour, which is strong. You can taste it right in the back of your palate. You get a little bit of acidity or wininess out of it, a, a wine, a, like a fruity wineness, like a, a, like a wine, if you guess, uh, that, that sort of grape fruity. Um, and you will get very good flavour out of it, um, nice floral, floral notes to it. Should coffee be treated like wine? Coffee should, yes. Yes, it should. Um, it hasn't been, but it's, uh, the, the, the knowledge and the interest, I guess, of the consumers is, is getting to the stage now where people are interested in it and they want to know where it comes from. Every country tastes different and every region of coffee within that country tastes different as well. Does coffee deserve to be priced like wine? Yes, I mean, it 
It does, and I think in the in the retail sector, it is priced like wine. Um, there's there's quite a heavy, quite a healthy price to pay for a, a cup of coffee or a, a pound of coffee in the shops. But the farmers um, don't see much of it. The farmers don't see much of that. Correct. Coffee importers like Simon are crucial to the future of producers like Tadessa in Ethiopia. To stay in the market, they need to convince buyers that quality makes a difference. Tadessa is hoping his emphasis on traditional quality control techniques will help find new markets. Finally, handpicking takes place by women which are employed in this factory and they pick the uh, bad beans which are insect beaten, maybe which are rotten or, or uh, which are uh, broken beans will be picked by the woman and uh, finally this is the coffee which is fit for export. This is how quality control is kept in this processing unit. On a sales trip to Europe, Tedessa is bypassing world markets to make his own sales direct to discerning importers of high quality coffee. This is Tedessa from Oromia Coffee Farmers from Ethiopia. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can keep the quality and to, we can keep the sustainability of our business. Right. Okay. We, we need this to grow because we are directly representing the farmers. Yeah. And uh, these farmers have nothing other than coffee. There is a saying in Ethiopia about coffee, even by the government. Mm -hmm. A one-eyed man shall not play with a sand. Right. Since he's a one-eyed, if he is going to play with the sand, he will lose that eye. The main export of our country is coffee. Mm -hmm. We are getting, we used to get 75% of the foreign exchange earnings from coffee. It's a very difficult name. You got your fee. Yeah, okay, you say it uh, once again, please. You got your fee. Yeah, okay. You got chafé. Yeah, you got chafé. Yeah. It's an uh, excellent taste. It's a beautiful body. It, uh, the body uh, stays a long time in your mouth. It's uh, very nice and uh, it's uh, very nice. It would be very nice when we could uh, discuss about a bit more about this coffee. This coffee is the best from from. This uh, this coffee is uh, the best the best of these four. Yeah yeah yeah. I know that. <laughs> it, 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 it is the best in the, in the one of the best fine Arabica coffees in the world. Yeah yeah. But uh, yeah, I know that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> this is very nice. Yeah, you yeah, know that yeah, yeah. it's very nice for us. We know that as well. Yeah yeah. You can deliver what you promise. Yeah. <laughs> because we keep the samples here, you know. Yeah yeah. I know I know that. <laughs> Tadessa Mescala may have found a niche market for the quality Ethiopian coffee he is selling. But in the current hostile market, what's the future for other small coffee producers?